there. My name is Malka Stromer. I'm with Sound Sports Imaging, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on soft tissue mass characterization. I am recording live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, home of the NBA champion Toronto Raptors. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Please leave your questions till the end so um, we'll be able to get through all the content and um, we'll get started. Okay, here we are. Soft tissue mass characterization. Firstly, I want to provide you with a disclaimer. Um, myself, I am a registered diagnostic medical sonographer and my colleague Janine is a registered musculoskeletal sonographer. And we as sonographers are delegated the act of doing ultrasound uh, from the radiologist or doctor who ordered the ultrasound or who has asked uh, us to be providing them with diagnostic images. So that is our responsibility. We are being delegated the act to provide diagnostic images uh, to the physicians and we are the eyes of the radiologist and the eyes of the doctor. Now when training um, other medical professionals with great power comes great responsibility. And if we utilize all of the information we have about a patient, including statistics, history, biochemistry, and ultrasound findings, we can work to enhance patient care and healthcare costs by making quicker, more accurate diagnoses and minimizing additional costly tests. So we need to start from the beginning and remember our sonography language. Echogenic, means the production of echoes. So the different shades of gray on an ultrasound image are actually all echogenic. It's only the structures that are anechoic, meaning do not have echoes that are black, that are not echogenic. The other terms therefore are comparative terms. Hyperechoic, hypoechoic, and isoechoic are terms used to compare tissues next to one another. If something is brighter than the neighboring tissue, it is hyperechoic to that tissue. If something is darker than the neighboring, neighboring tissue, it is hypoechoic uh, to that tissue. If something is the same, the same echoes as the neighboring tissue, it is considered to be isoechoic. So if we look at echogenic, Actually, all of these pictures are echogenic. There's only an area right here and right here that are anechoic, meaning without echoes. But everything else is bright, has echoes. They are echogenic. Hyperechoic, as we recall, is brighter than. So if we look at this image, this is actually a liver and a kidney, we can see that uh, this area of the liver is brighter than this area, so this is hyperechoic to this area. This is the kidney, therefore the renal sinus fat is brighter than the cortex of the kidney. There are hypoechogenicities, darker than. So we can see actually in two liver, livers, there are areas that are darker within the liver. All these areas here, darker than. So those would be considered hypoechoic to the liver. Anechoic, as we recall, is lacking echoes. And therefore, this is most commonly associated with something that is fluid filled. It does not have echoes. And we can see here with the cyst and the gallbladder, that these are anechoic structures and they appear black on ultrasound. Isoechoic are structures that are having the same echogenicity next to one another. So here's an example of uh, testicles, two testicles within the scrotal sac. They both have the same echogenicity. 
We can also oftentimes compare the liver and spleen. Oftentimes they have a very similar echogenicity and are isoechoic. It can be quite difficult to get uh, a liver and a spleen on the same image. Uh, it's oftentimes only seen if the person has a large left lobe of their liver or splenomegaly or both. But you can use a dual image and see that here uh, is an image of the liver and here is a spleen and they both look quite similar. So therefore, they're isoechoic. It's also important to remember the echogenicity ladder and to be able to know what normal tissue should look like. So uh, we're actually visualizing here the liver kidney interface. And we should see that the liver is brighter than the cortex of the kidney. The brightest echo is actually the renal sinus fat. And then we have a, a darker area here, posterior to the kidney, which actually is muscle, the kidney bed, with quadratus lumborum and psoas muscles that lie posterior and posteromedial to the kidney. Those are all a correct echogenicity ladder, meaning those echoes uh, and the comparison of those echoes is normal. However, if we're visualizing uh, the cortex of the kidney being brighter than the liver, that's not normal. Uh, if we're seeing the liver really, really bright and then the cortex of the kidney really dark, what's going on? We need to figure that out and understand the echogenicity ladder. It's also important to understand terms such as heterogeneous and homogeneous to help us when we look at soft tissue masses. So something that is homogeneous has a smooth echo texture throughout. Something that is heter heterogeneous may have different echoes within uh, the mass, maybe irregular borders. We can describe all of that and we can uh, also use the terms heterogeneous and homogeneous. We're actually looking at a scrotal sac, one with the left uh, testicle quite normal and the right testicle is quite abnormal, heterogeneous echo texture and actually invasion into scrotal wall, which would be a testicular cancer. Artifacts. Artifacts are an incredibly valuable uh, finding uh, on ultrasound and help us to distinguish soft tissue masses uh, based on uh, what we're visualizing. Again, artifacts are not real, but they allow us to provide, they provide us with information on the content and a structure of the tissues that we're looking at. So incredibly valuable to understand ultrasound artifacts. They're useful in everyday imaging. They're used to determine the makeup of the tissue being imaged. And the only time we get concerned about an artifact in our image is if it is distracting or inaccurately displacing the image. Here are some examples of artifacts that are helpful for us when trying to determine uh, the tissue makeup. Posterior enhancement or increased through transmission is a, basically a beam of light behind a mass, typically associated with a cystic structure. Posterior shadowing is associated with a solid mass, oftentimes a rock hard solid mass. Um, and we're not getting echoes behind that structure because it's being attenuated. We can get reverberation, ring down or comet tail artifacts, slice thickness, side lobe artifacts, mirror image artifacts, and speckle artifacts. Here are some examples of artifacts. Posterior enhancement, as you can see, um, is like a beam of light behind uh, typically a cystic structure. And it helps us diagnose that um, structure as cystic because the sound waves go right through that cystic or fluid filled structure. And therefore the tissues posterior to that are extremely bright. Shadowing, posterior shadowing happens uh, behind a structure that is incredibly hard, rock hard. And it produces distal acoustic shadowing because of the absorption of the sound waves in that rock hard structure. This produces this dark posterior shadowing and helps us to distinguish solid versus cystic. Posterior enhancement, cystic, 
posterior shadowing of rock hard solid structures. For example, we are looking at uh, two different um, gallbladders. We have a gallbladder here with an anechoic lumen, uh, another gallbladder here, anechoic lumen, and they both have echogenic structures within it. One echogenic structure has posterior shadowing, the other does not. Well, the posterior shadowing helps us to determine that this, this structure within this gallbladder is rock hard and solid. Another helpful tool uh, when we're looking at something like this would be able to move the patient. If we move the patient, this rock hard structure with shadowing actually moves as well. And that's characteristic of a gallstone. In this case, this structure does not have shadowing, therefore it is not rock hard. Also, when we move the patient, this structure does not move. That is characteristic of a gallbladder polyp that grows from the wall of the gallbladder. Other artifacts, the ring down or comet tail artifact, as we can see in this image here, is associated with, um, you can see it's along the diaphragmatic surface, associated with air in um, the, the lungs. And we can get this air artifact, the ring down comet tail artifact with these multiple lines that are happening uh, behind a bright echo, often associated with air. Other associations of ring down or comet tail artifacts are associated with um, metallic structures. This in it is an example of an IUD in the endometrial canal of a uterus, and it produces this ring down shadowing. This one's a little harder to see, as you can see a bright echo. Uh, there's also this ring down or comet tail artifact uh, coming from that. And that's a little cholesterol crystal in a Rokotinsky ashoff sinus in somebody with adenomyomatosis. So these artifacts are helpful to understand what uh, tissue we're looking at. Mirror image artifact. You can see that this is actually an image of the liver. There's an echogenic mass within that liver. And then on the other side of the diaphragm, another echogenic mass. That can't be right. There can't be a mass in the same place in the liver and the lung. However, this is a mirror image and it often happens with a large specular reflector such as the diaphragm. Uh, mirror image is very helpful in finding that if we see a mirror image, that's indicative of a normal uh, pleural space, pleural lung, uh, lung. If we're not seeing um, mirror image artifact, we may question that the lung uh, pleural space is abnormal. Mass characterization, okay. Um, we need to look at and decipher the tissue that we're looking at and the characteristics too. Typically, if a mass looks ugly, it probably is. So in this uh, picture here, we're actually looking at two different breast masses. One that's totally anechoic, and you can see a beam of light right behind it, which is indicative of posterior enhancement, cystic structure. And another mass right here that is irregular borders, it's hypoechoic, no posterior shadowing, no posterior enhancement. Oftentimes women uh, feel solid masses within their breast and may come in quite scared. Um, if we visualize a cyst, that is a very positive thing for the, for the patient. However, if we visualize an ugly mass such as this, it's much more worrisome. Cysts, however, can be quite complex depending on the fluid that's within that cystic structure we may see fluid-fluid um, levels, light amount of fluid uh, and low level echoes indicating different types of fluid like oil and water. We can still see the enhancement behind this uh, particular mass and therefore that's indicated, indicative of a cystic structure. So that's positive, however, there's different fluid. So depending on the patient um, history, this could be blood, it could be a hematoma. This could be a galactosil, it could be milk. Could it be an abscess? Is it an acute onset finding? All important information 
and important to understand our patient history, biochemistry, etc. So that takes us to tools for mass characterization. Now the tools that we have with our ultrasound machine are very helpful when looking at soft tissue masses. Doppler, for example. Doppler shows movement. Color Doppler within uh, vessels to show movement towards and away from the transducer. We may not need to know what direction the flow is, just the presence or absence of flow. So we may want to use something like Power Doppler, which allows us to pick up um, low flow. It's a much more sensitive uh, tool and a Doppler tool that we can use. It doesn't tell us direction, but we may not need that information. Spectral Doppler allows us to actually characterize the waveform, and that could provide us with more information and uh, about and to help us characterize that soft tissue mass. Elastography is a valuable tool. It's used a lot in liver imaging and breast imaging and other aspects of ultrasound to look at the elasticity of a mass. Is it a hard and a, or is it softer mass? And elastography allows us to, to characterize that. Ultrasound contrast is also an extremely valuable tool. My mentor, Dr. Stephanie Wilson, has uh, developed algorithms for um, ultrasound contrast of liver masses and is able to characterize um, liver masses based on the patterns in the ultrasound contrast and with no need for any other type of imaging or maybe even biopsy. And patient history, the biochemistry history, so extremely valuable to put all of these tools together in order to solve the puzzle for our patient. And we can with ultrasound. Now the ultrasound characteristics alone, when we look at something that is an acute process, an acute process typically is hyperemic. There's going to be increased vascularity to an acute onset process. The uh, structure will also typically become swollen. And therefore, an ultrasound will have an increase in size of that area, decrease in echogenicity because of the hyperemia and the fluid um, within that structure. Chronic structures tend to shrink and fibrose. They may even calcify. Therefore, there will be a decrease in size and an increase in echogenicity, brighter due to the fibrotic tissue and calcifications. We need to look at the simplicity of the structure versus the complexity of the structure. Simple versus complex. We need to look at the statistical appearances of masses on ultrasound and knowing um, statistically what these masses may be based on uh, numbers and history and all that. Knowing tissue characteristics of pathologies knowing what a pathology is made up to understand what it would look like on ultrasound. For example, a lipoma. A lipoma is made of fat. Fat in the liver, for example, looks bright. Fat um, in soft tissue may be isoechoic and just may be a, um, a displacement or a, a change in tissue um, borders looking at soft tissue. So understanding the tissue characteristics is very important to help distinguish mass characterization. And it's vitally important to be to listen and be attuned to our patients. We need to quantify and qualify their pain. Now we know that everybody has different uh, pain standards. Um, they they react to pain in different ways. But if we pay attention to our patient, we can determine if this pain is acute or chronic. Did it just happen to them today? Did it happen, has it been going on for years? Is it pinpoint? Can they put a finger on where that pain is? Or is it diffuse? Biochemistry. Can we order biochemical tests that will help us uh, figure out this patient information? Will help us lead to an organ or area that we need to look at to be able to find the soft tissue mass. Patient demographics and health history is vital. 
we need to understand that and help us solve this patient information. And we, as uh, being using ultrasound as a diagnostic tool, is amazing because we are right at the bedside with the patient and are able to speak to our patient as we're doing our test. Therefore, ask questions based on what you see. Is there a history of any pathology? Have they had surgery? Are there any additional signs and symptoms that may, we may want to talk about based on things that we see? Because that may help with the information that we're, uh, we've been given and the sonographic findings that we have. So let's look at several examples. This example here is taken, was taken transvaginally in the left adnexa of a patient that had acute onset of left lower quadrant pain. Now, this image is actually of this patient's left ovary. Now, typically pathology of an ovary overtakes the ovary, but we are seeing a little bit of remnant ovarian tissue along the edge here. But the soft tissue mass is actually quite complex. It's ugly looking. What could it be? Well, let's use the tools in our toolbox to help us. So we'll put on some color Doppler. Color Doppler here, as you can see, shows no flow within this mass. Now, because of the fact that this is an acute onset of left lower quadrant pain in a young female, this is probably a hemorrhagic cyst. Now, how would we follow that up? We would see if it ruptures or if it goes away in a few days or a week. Um, there's, you know, the history again associated with this patient having no increased white blood cell count, um, being young, all help us in this, in this um, potential diagnosis of, of this soft tissue mass. The other thing to note, especially with blood, is that blood has several different uh, appearances on ultrasound. It can look like many different things. It can be totally anechoic, to having low level echoes, to having some complexity to it like this mass here, to being totally echogenic. So it's vitally important to understand the history and the complexity of the masses that we may visualize. Now here's an example of a hypoechoic mass within a patient's liver. This is um, a patient that had pinpoint pain, elevated white blood cell count. Uh, you can see that it's hypoechoic, but it doesn't have a regular, it does not have regular borders. It looks irregular. It may have some echogenicity within it as well. Uh, what could this be? Let's use our tools. So we throw on some color Doppler. Again, there is no flow within that mass. So it's unlikely to be something um, malignant. Also with a patient history of elevated white blood cell count, pinpoint pain, um, this is probably an abscess. The history may also be associated. Why would they have a liver abscess? Did they have some type of biliary disease? Did they have some type of sepsis? Let's understand their history to get this better before we stick a needle into it, drain it, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, we also may, in abscesses, we may see echogenicities ring down shadowing with air. Air also will rise. So we may see in abscesses, echogenicities, at the upper end and then dirty shadowing behind it or ring down indicating air artifacts. Putting together history, using our tools with Doppler um, and, find, and using our ultrasound findings to determine uh, what the best uh, possibility inference for this mass may be. Here's an example of two testicles within a scrotal sac. We can see that they're fairly isoechoic. This one may be slightly more hypo, but it's definitely larger. This is a young man who came in with an acute onset of scrotal pain. So again, utilizing our tools. We can see here that the left testicle has lit up nicely with blood flow, and there is zero blood flow within the right testicle. This is an um, emergency to taking this patient to the operating room uh, due to torsion. 
making sure that uh, there may be a possibility to detort um, this testicle, but it may have lost it already as there is no flow. So uh, as you can see here, the hypoechoic, uh, hypoechogenicity is slightly on, in this particular case, but increase in size, decrease in echogenicity associated with an acute onset of testicular torsion. Here's another example. This is a, a testicle. This is the left testicle and a hypoechoic area in the area of the epididymal tail. Now, it's not often that we visualize the epididymal tail um, in the testicle. So it seems to be quite hypoechoic and enlarged. We turn long on it and we can see how enlarged this uh, epididymal tail is. And again, how hypoechoic it is. In a patient that has acute onset of scrotal pain, elevated white blood cell count, and middle-aged male, put on color Doppler, you can see the extreme hyperemia associated with this uh, epididymal tail. This is a case of epididymitis. Now here's an example of an echogenic mass, an echogenic mass within the liver. Actually, it is also producing some posterior enhancement. Now, in a patient uh, that has this was actually an asymptomatic incidental finding just found in a patient's liver with no signs or symptoms, no history of anything. So statistically, uh, echogenic masses um, in the liver are probably hemangiomas. And oftentimes, um, we may find hemangiomas with posterior enhancement because of the fact that they are clumps of blood vessels, abnormal clumps of blood vessels. We're seeing them as bright because of the walls that we're resolving, all crunched up together. And so let's put on color Doppler to be sure. And as we can see, there's no blood flow. So indicative of a benign uh, mass. So statistically, based on the fact that this patient has no signs or symptoms, it's a bright mass with posterior enhancement, no blood flow, this mass is most likely to be a hemangioma. So how sound sports imaging can help? Uh, we can advise you on an ultrasound unit that may be uh, best suit your needs. And we're here to educate. We can help um, in any way to produce uh, programs for your practices. We provide seminars and workshops with lots of hands-on training, working towards point of care ultrasound certifications. And we can have continued support through your journey with quality assurance and process improvement. I hope today has given you some information about soft tissue mass characterization. We can use these tools on a soft tissue masses throughout the body. And understanding the tools that we have with our ultrasound unit and uh, the puzzles that we have to put together with patient history uh, and information, um, biochemistry, etc. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at info at soundsportsimaging.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember that at Sound Sports Imaging, we provide solutions to all your ultrasound needs. Hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Take care.